hang on. I'm, I'm going to move to a different spot because the sound got bad again. Okay. Um, All right. I'm going to intro while you get settled in and we'll see. Yeah, how go ahead. I'm, I'm just going to try to so, hold the phone still. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to episode 17 of the H2 Bay Show. Uh, we are revisiting a topic we covered about five weeks ago, uh, macro. Uh, obviously, a very big deal. I'm sure you've all been hearing lots about it, thinking lots about it. And halfway through the comment period now, uh, with the deadline coming up for that on June 27th, uh, Dr. Mike had a, a recent radio show kind of going through his uh, evolution of thinking on macro and healthcare transformation and the comments that he was going to be submitting to CMS. And uh, we'll get into it. You know, obviously, uh, we've talked on the show, you've had interactions with CMS in a lot of different ways. Uh, met with Andy Slavitt, um, lots of different things going on in that front. So we'll go through all of it. But the goal of our show today is to, to think of just about that is how are you going to contribute to this conversation? How are you going to prepare your own comments, uh, speaking to the viewers? How are you going to prepare your own comments for uh, CMS? You know, everybody has them. I believe it with submitting them and getting that information to the folks at CMS. So. Uh, with that, I want to say welcome to you, Dr. Mike, and uh, hey. we'll, we'll kind of sure. just real quickly, um, the, the show, your show that inspired this one came out about a week or two ago. Uh, you called it the Obama yeah. shell, uh, shell Game, Obamacare Shell Game, yes. and uh, I really appreciated the process that you went through there, and that's why I wanted you to come in and, and, and share it with the HC Biz folks. Sure, sure. Um, well, I, I think when you look at MACRA and you look at the entire body of, of regulations that covers health, you know, care folks who, who take care of Medicare patients, um, I think it, it, you are best served by interpreting what you see there as part of a broader picture. Uh, obviously, the MACRA proposed rule is part of this big shift from what they call volume based care to value based care and this has acquired a great deal of momentum over at least the past 10 years you know the pqrs stuff came out in 2006 and people have been talking about value based medicine and pay for performance and all of these things for at least 10 years if not longer um, with a minimum of objective evidence to actually back it up so this you know has has benefited from what i call a, a propaganda based momentum um, that is, is sort of, you know, it's kind of like the emperor is not wearing any clothes when it comes to talking about value. So what we talked about on the radio was that when Obamacare was first being litigated, you know, right after, um, you know, the election in 2008, that um, the, the discussion where everyone started the discussion, where everyone actually agreed was on two issues, which was cost and access. It was um, a matter of, of saying, look, there was no problem with the quality of care that, um, that folks were receiving. The problem is it cost too much. And everybody agreed on this. And we understood and agreed it was taking an increasingly bigger share of the gross domestic product. You know, spending per capita was rising very quickly. Um, and as a result, of obviously, there's going to be a growing proportion of folks that can't afford care or can't afford insurance premiums. And so cost and access were two concepts that everybody agreed on. Uh, but from that point forward, the shell game begins. So what happens in a shell game? Everybody knows you've got three shells, you've got a ball underneath them, and the person playing the game with you is, you know, not only good at moving their hands around so you can't follow the shell with the ball, but they're also good magicians and they can, can palm the ball out from under the shell so that at the moment you go to pick the right shell, none of the shells have a ball underneath it. The ball's in the, in the dealer's hand. And, you know, I think we're dealing with a similar process here where the conversation's been, been morphed by a shell game and so that we're not talking about cost and access anymore. Now we're talking about quality and value. And what does that do for the folks that control the narrative? Well, cost and access are very easy to measure, right? We can measure how much healthcare costs, we can measure per capita spending, and we can count the number of folks who are uninsured. And that makes success or failure of any plan that you have very easy to measure. 
The other thing that cost and access do as concepts is appropriately assign blame across the entire healthcare system for where that, you know, where the, the elements are that are responsible for the growth in cost. Doctors, we certainly take our, our piece of that. I mean, doctor fees are about 11% or maybe a little bit more of, of all of healthcare costs. So we'll take our 11% worth. But with the understanding that insurance plans, the government, hospitals, uh, all these folks also have a much bigger piece of the pie than we do. But when you move the argument with that shell game and you're no longer talking about cost and access the way you should be, and you're talking about quality and value, now what happens? Two things happen. One is quality and value can't be measured at the 50,000 foot level. I mean, you can try, and that's what MACRA, the new rule, tries to do, um, and it will be unsuccessful as have you know efforts in the past, um, but it also... Uh, puts blame uh, squarely on the, the doctors uh, because now it's a matter of what's happening. How, you know, how is quality and value defined? It's defined at the level of the transaction. If you go into an appliance store to buy a big screen TV and you look at the TVs and you look at the prices, either the quality and value is there and you buy or the quality and value is not there and you don't buy. You know, healthcare doesn't work that way because of a third party payer. And so measuring value and measuring quality becomes almost impossible. And that allows the folks to control the narrative to say about just about anything they want to regarding the success or failure of the plans that they foist on doctors and patients in America. So right. I'll talk long enough. I'll let you but, go. So in, in, in this game, who, who is the dealer? Who's, who's moving the shells around in your opinion? Uh, I would say the dealer is an aggregate of, uh, you know, government first and foremost, um, with, you know, hospitals and insurers and, 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 and IT vendors, folks in the IT space, not everybody to be sure, um, but probably the largest vendors are probably the ones moving the shells around because they're the ones who benefit when the, um, when the conversation is, is turned to uh, quality and value. <clears throat> then, you know, I mean, how many articles have we read from various corners of the universe whose introduction is now that we're moving away from volume based care to value based care and that's their introductory paragraph and you accept mm -hmm. that as true and you know that allows them to to pedal whatever it is they're trying to pedal but yeah I, I think the shell game is 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 the other competitive stakeholders in the system besides physicians gotcha and, and you separate the hospitals from the physicians in that regard too um do, the, do you see these yes, regulations which is an important Just, concept Okay. Uh, because I yeah, just sidebar there, um, because a lot of times hospitals and physicians are lumped together under the term provider. Wow. Yeah, and it's one of the reasons that many of us physicians staunchly object to the term provider. You know, some people say, well, that term's beneath us. Well, I don't really care about that. I mean, I agree. I didn't go to provider school. I went to medical school <laughs> and that's fine. But the, the real problem with that term from a practical standpoint is that um, classic example within macro, um, there is that whole section, and you and I have talked about this, that requires or would require individual physicians to attest that we're not um, data blocking, right? right? That we're, we're not fighting interoperability. And if you read the language of the 962 page macro, they say, well, we have evidence that providers have been data blocking. And I read that and I went, well, that's interesting. I don't know of any doctors that data block. Why would doctors want to data block? And they cite this study. It was presented to Congress in 2015. Uh, so I went and pulled the study. Well, in the study, they talk about providers, but by providers, they mean hospitals. And certainly hospitals have been doing things to configure the systems to data block. They don't want to share medical records with competition, all that kind of thing. So clearly hospitals have been doing it. But but CMS did a little shell game of their own right there where they said, I've got a report that talks about providers, meaning hospitals. I'll morph that into language in macro that yeah. refers to providers that call physicians providers. So, again, got to be very careful about the about the wordsmithing, the slate of hand, the shell game. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's a common problem. Actually, I'm, I'm trying to look it up real quick. There was a episode of, um, oh, I can't say his name, Oliver. He used to be on The Daily Show. He's on HBO now. And okay. he, uh, he was referring to basically how the media uses studies. All these examples where they're making these, like, the, the headline would be like this bizarre claim. And then it would get set all around and everybody would read that and it'd be like, Oh, if I eat chocolate, it's going to cure all my migraines. And then you dig into the study, and 
know, the authors would be like, well, we didn't mention chocolate at all in the study. And they would walk you through how the media made up the story. But it doesn't matter what the truth right. is behind the headline, because for the most part, people read the headlines. And I think that's, a, that's right. certainly an issue that, that uh, we face here in, in healthcare transformation is when you say, we don't want to talk about costs, we want to talk about value. Because I don't want to charge you, you know, a huge cost for something that provides you a little value. People buy into that. It sounds good. But yeah, we should focus on value. But the the issue behind the narrative that I think you struck on and that I agree with is value to who, and how are you? How are you defining that? And that's that's the trick behind the the headline, if you will. And I don't even know if it's always, um, you know, uh, uh, with malice. I think that the people producing the headlines are often you know, very much believe it and don't understand that distinction. Um, so that's well, agreed. And, and that's, that's the other shell game, right? That's the shell game of accountability, which is that, you know, when you talk about say macro, for instance, is, you know, who is the person that would stand up in front of the whole world or in front of television cameras and say, this is mine. This is my plan. I, I, I am totally emotionally bought into it. I am the one who thinks that this is going to be great. And it's hard to find that entity or that person because these things, you know, I mean, even the regulation, right? There's a little bit of, of, of shell game finger pointing, you know, CMS can say, well, we're just following the law, right? Congress wrote the law, the legislation yep. called macro was signed into law. We are merely carrying out the law and that's true. And then, you know, the legislature can say, well, we just gave the framework to pass it to CMS. You need to talk to them. Mm -hmm. Now to Andy Slavitt's credit, in the interview that will air on on my show tomorrow, he was, uh, you know, he had some language that said that he was willing to let the buck stop with him, and say that this is our program, we own it, and we need to make it work. That's different than saying, you know, we love it and we think it's the panacea for our things. Yep. But I, I admired his willingness to kind of step up and say, you know what, this is our, you know, our ball game. We inherited this. It's our job to make it work, and we're not going to finger point, which, you know, at face value was, was an admirable thing for him to say, I think. Um, yeah. But it's it's difficult to find who, you know, who actually is creating these ideas versus who's repeating them. And, you know, you know, it's adding to this propaganda based momentum that has given this thing so much life and so much um, acceptance. Yeah, right. And it's, it's like a built in uh, fun, fear, uncertainty and doubt. Uh, you don't have to work to create it if you want to uh, to use it in a scenario because it's just about it's a huge regulation it's hard to understand you know I mean, there's all these people involved there's you know this uh, the headline shell game going on and yeah it's just it's, it's the nature of the beast when you're trying to put a single organization in between what is it a third of the population and their health care effectively that uh, medicare is a huge intermediary um and you're just yes. not going to have these problems so um, what I wanted to actually real quick side note, you just mentioned it. I, I intended to point out Andy Slavitt being on your show this week right at the beginning. So uh, you just mentioned it there. What day, what, day, what yeah. time, how did the interview go? Real sure. quick, let's take sure. an interlude. Thanks, Don. Appreciate it. Yeah, the, the, the show is called The Doctor's Lounge, and it airs on uh, a website called America's Web Radio. Uh, that's just www.americaswebradio, all one word, no apostrophes or anything, americaswebradio.com. It airs tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock and will be available as a podcast sometime the following week. Um, but last night I was in the process of, you know, doing the post-production on it and bringing it, uh, boiling it down, and um, I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, it was an honor to have him on the show. Uh, I think, you know, at a personal level, I'm very impressed with Mr. Slavitt. I, um, I think that he um, has got one of the world's toughest jobs to face the whole world uh, and, and try to sell and implement this thing. Um, so, you know, he's got a lot of guts and he's got a lot of class. And, uh, you know, personally, I like it. Um, interview, very interesting to listen to. You know, it starts off with a lot of, you know, the prepared message, but we actually got off of the script uh, quite a bit and, uh, and, and had a couple of questions that, uh, you know, starting about a third of the way in that are, uh, rather substantive and the answers are, are pretty substantive. So, um, I, I think it's worth an hour uh, of your time to listen to, and I appreciate you giving me a chance to plug it.
Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I mentioned before, I listen to your shows quite a bit um, and I get a lot out of them because it is that pure doctor perspective. Uh, and, and, you know, when you do have guests on, they've been good as well. So I highly recommend the show. Um, and certainly this one, I mean, it's a, a big one to have a guest of that magnitude on there. So very cool. Yeah. And I'm going to try again to drop a link here. I, I failed a second ago because I kicked myself out. I'll throw in the sidebar here. Still, okay. still trying to get uh, uh, to get my my arms around Blab after 17 shows, I guess. So there's a link to the to um, America's Web Radio, specifically into the Doctors Lounge there on the right for anyone else to um, check that out. So back yes, to the show then. It. End of our interlude. Um, what I next? What I'd like to get into is you had some uh, really interesting examples on what information is being used to tell the narrative and to set the stage for why do we need to move to value and quality? And um, let, let's get into that a little bit. What, what did you find when you went digging there? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. What you're referring to is the primary piece of information that the, the shell gamers use to move the, the narrative from a, uh, you know, cost access narrative to a value uh, uh, narrative. And, um, and that was a, a piece of a report that came out uh, published by the World Health Organization in 2000. And it was this report that looked at life expectancies and infant mortality rates in countries around the world. And, and what you see uh, here is that, and this has been, you know, highlighted by many folks trying to move this to a value uh, discussion is that the United States spends more per capita on health care than any other country in the world. Very true. We spend more money on everything, including health care. Um, but yet, uh, you know, our, our infant mortality rates and our life expectancies don't reflect the extra money that's spent and that our life expectancy and infant mortalities are no better than most other uh, developed countries. Uh, and in some cases might be slightly worse. And so this is and again, if you don't pay attention and you just kind of gloss over the message, they say, well, we're not getting our money's worth. You know, why is it if we're spending all this money that our life expectancies aren't better and our infant mortalities aren't better? Well, the answer is pretty simple, which is that life expectancy and infant mortality are not valid measures of a health system's performance. Right? The, the, the life expectancy depends on two things. Assuming you have clean water and right. sanitary conditions to live in, which eliminate the large infectious disease epidemics like cholera and whatever, um, that, that will obviously wipe out lots of people regardless of age and drag life expectancy down, it comes to, down to a matter of genetics and lifestyle, right? If I were to move this camera down to my midsection, you would see a gut there. And we know that <laughs> <laughs> statistically, all right, statistically, <laughs> We know that short guys with guts don't live as long because of diabetes, hypertension, that kind of thing. Now, I'm a doctor. I know that. And I do the best I can to try to control it. But is it my doctor's fault that that thing is there? Is it the healthcare system's fault that that thing is there? Certainly not. Right. Um, on the infant mortality side, you know, I don't treat neonates. So I might be the most brilliant doctor on the planet or I might be an idiot, but my actions don't affect how long babies live in the first 30 days. Uh, sure. You know, infant mortality has huge variations in how it's reported, how it's measured between countries. And the differences are really a, a question of, of the differences in measurement methods versus the, any actual difference. So infant mortality, life expectancy, they don't make a difference. And the last thing we'll talk about, and I think you hit on this, Don, was if you look at, uh, at Japanese people who live in Japan versus Japanese Americans, yeah. right? That'd be a good thing, right? Because Japan has the best life expectancy, right? In 1980, it was somewhere around 79 years, and now it's about 84 years. But how about a comparison between Japanese who live in Japan and Japanese who live in America? Um, is there a difference in their life expectancies, right? Because the only variable you're changing, right, your independent variable in that experiment is the healthcare system and nothing else. Everything else is controlled for, genetics, diet, Etc. And it turns out that the Japanese Americans living in America in the American healthcare system live. In fact, it's actually six months longer um, than uh, native Japanese living in Japan. Oh, no kidding. So, longer. so there's no difference. So if you yeah. really look at the numbers carefully, instead of just accepting the narrative, it turns out that uh, at least for, for Japanese, uh, you know, in 1980, there's no difference. Yeah, so right. this whole argument that says, oh, we're not getting our money's worth and our healthcare system stinks 
because life expectancy isn't what it should be and infant mortality isn't what it should be is invalid. And in fact, the editor in chief of the original report in 2000, the World Health, World Health Organization report from 2000, the editor in chief came out in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010 and said, stop using this data for this purpose. It's inappropriate. It needs to stop. Right. Yeah. And he talked about it being um, basically they're doing an apples to oranges comparison in a lot of cases because a lot of the numbers were guesses. They didn't have sources for the data and they did their best to make guesses because it was appropriate for what they were trying to accomplish with their report, but not appropriate for what they're trying to accomplish here. So it's, right. you know, that, that, yeah, that was the thing she was making. Back to the Japanese thing, what I found was interesting and looking for the, the numbers that you mentioned on your show, I found uh, an article from like a Japanese tour board or something like that, that was like the exact opposite analysis of how come when people move to Japan, their life expectancy doesn't go up. And the breakdown of it was, you know, exactly the same from that way, obviously, is that when you move to Japan, you bring your genetics and your culture with you. You know, you might eat a little bit, you know, more like Japanese being in Japan because that's what's accessible to you. But all of your old habits and all of your old customs don't go away just because you've changed your geography. And obviously the healthcare system there um, can't override that just like the healthcare system here can't override that. So that was that was a that was a really neat oh, way for you to make that. You have to point. share that like with that. me. I hadn't seen that, but so yeah, these check are out folks of all ethnic backgrounds who moved to Japan from the United States. Exactly, exactly. They should be benefiting was... from a better healthcare system, right? The yep. one that, is, in theory, offers the highest life expectancy in the world, and it turns out nothing happened. Right. So you look at it from both directions, you get the same answer. So the uh, the post uh, for this week, uh, I'll, I'll I sent you the link to it. The link yep. to that article is is in there too. Um, so yeah, okay. check it, out. it was a much, it was a much less scientific thing. It was more of like a, a person writing and looking into it on their own, a thing of curiosity, but I mean, it lined up perfectly. So it was good stuff. Um, so the other thing I wanted to touch on here, um, you know, you made the, the clear case and I think you, you touched on this earlier on too, is that cost and access you viewed as being a worthy cause, uh, and a measurable cause, whereas value and quality. Um, you didn't say we're not worthy causes. You said they were not measurable. And yeah, you got to be careful. Do you mean not measurable ideas. on a scale or like, yeah, explain, you know, like elaborate on that point a little bit. Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah, I got to be careful here. So yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to sort of be sure I get this right. Um, it is easy. And again, it's another shell game that the folks on the other side of the fence play here that when you say that, you know, when I say, the, the, the quality and value um, are, are, are not the best way to approach this discussion. It sounds like we're against quality and value, that we don't care about quality and value. And, and nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, in the practice of medicine, we're always looking for better ways to do what we do. And, you know, in my particular field of ear, nose and throat, you know, the advances in everything from tonsillectomy to sinus surgery to, you know, you know laryngology and vocal cord and airway stuff has changed dramatically for the better, has improved significantly over the 21 years that I've been in practice following training. And we're always pushing to, to, um, to make things better. You know, none of us would suggest that, you know, everything is just fine the way it is and that we shouldn't strive to make it better. Uh, the problem is the mechanism by which you do it. And, you know, our disagreement is not on concepts, it's on methodology. And, you know, this is a classic shell game that they play that if you say, OK, we don't like big government control of health care and they point and say, well, you don't care about the uninsured. Well, that's a bunch of BS. You know, we care about the uninsured more than anybody because to us, they have faces and names and mm-hmm. we're the bearers of bad news that say you need something that we can't give you. So it's a much more personal thing to dox. But they play the shell game and say, well, if you're against big government, you must be against the intentions. You know, they substitute disagreement regarding methodology for disagreement regarding intent. Uh, And the same thing happens here. You know, we're all about quality and value to the extent that you can measure it. The problem is the narrative that they follow suggests that you can measure and reward or punish uh, along quality and value measurements, which don't make any sense. And so, you know, we're down to this, you know, gigantic box checking exercise in our EMRs uh, and, you know, no patient ever got well because we checked the right box. 
So, you know, mm -hmm. we're all about things that you can measure. I mean, if you look at things like, uh, you know, disease specific survival rates for things like prostate cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, uh, America is much better than all of these other countries. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, you know, it's a matter of, of, of picking the right things to measure. The problem isn't that, I mean, I, I, I defy anyone, I challenge anyone in the sound of our voices to show me a consumer group, to show me a, a, a disease advocacy group who has come out and said, the doctors who treat us aren't smart enough or they're not good enough. And I don't think anybody says that. What they say is it's too expensive and many of us don't have access. So right. let's pick, let's stay on the right problem and fix that problem yep. as opposed and to saying we're going to go to value and we're going to start, you know, we're going to we're going to write 465 value based measures into macro and say that that and there's yep. no scientific evidence that any of them have ever helped. Yep, no, that's, that's a good point. And the other thing, too, like behind the headline here is when you talk about the cost of care and you say, well, the cost of care is too high and you focus on quality and value. As you've already stated, you focus in on the on the actual clinical stuff. How is the clinical being delivered? How much is that costing and what are the outcomes of it? And you don't take into consideration the already existing administrative waste, um, you know, obviously fraud. That one, I kind of always put fraud off in its own category because obviously everybody's against fraud if we can stop it. But right. let's just take the administrative waste. And there's studies going back. Uh, I mean, you can find them all over the place. I've written on this that up to a, like a third of the money that we spend on healthcare is attributable to waste by different measures and just uh, sure. administrative complexity itself. So dealing with the, all the insurance companies and the billing and everything else, and now dealing with quality measures and everything else, upwards of, you know, depending on what you look at, $400 billion. So yeah. if you're attacking cost by saying, well, if we get quality up and we get value up, then that should, in theory, push costs down. I believe, I think that's the belief, but in doing so, you're actually making the other problems worse. You're actually throwing all of this additional administrative burden and waste into the system. Yeah. So even if you do get gains on one side, you're not going, you're, you're, you're going to break them on the other side. And with the way, well, that's the, right. yeah. And with the way the industry is growing up and, and, and the rapid adoption of technology over the last five to 10 years, you keep jamming these things in there. It's a, it's kind of a fragile system from a technology standpoint. And that's why we have the struggles that we do. So I always, I, I think that that's an area of all of this that just gets literally no attention. Um, and, you know, yes. HIPAA did have like its administrative simplification aspects to it. So they th were thinking about it, but like right now we just keep adding complexity. And, you know, we went through that CPC plus program uh, a while back on this show. And the, you know, that, that, it, that was just one program that in and of itself was introducing a whole bunch of new things and some new technology needs and everything else. So um, there's, there's just a lot more to this story than I feel like ever gets, you know, gets passed in, into those headlines. Yeah. And it, it, if you look at the 962 pages of macro, you end up in the same place, which is you say, okay, if I think of that in terms of cost and access, how does this help cost and access, right? I mean, we got some data regarding quality reporting measures, right, which is only one fourth of macro and that costs $15 billion a year. Yep. So, you know, use some primitive logic. I mean, you know, you, you come up with a conservative estimate that for all four parts of macro, you got $60 billion a year. So, you know, we're $60 billion a year in the hole before we get the first dollar of benefit among the cost and access, you know, access. And, uh, you know, again, it becomes very easy to measure and very easy to assess the failure if you stay with cost and access. But, uh, you know, you know, who's going to, you know, at, at 8750 per, you know, per capita in terms of spending, you know, how far does $60 billion go? I mean, that's probably six, seven million people. And, you know, you know, who's got the guts to go up, you know, behind a podium and face six million Americans and say, you can't have health care this year because all this other quality reporting stuff is more important than your health. Right. I don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough issue. It really is. And, and you know, I, I, I second your opinion from earlier is these guys, they've got a very difficult job to try to balance both sides of this, implement the legislation, find something that works, something that's going to and, and it's and it's got a scale to the entire country because um, it's, you know, yeah, we're talking about Medicare, but everyone else is basically going to follow suit with what gets set here in one form or another. Oh, so yes. it's a big deal. 
Um, so I'd like to shift into a little bit, uh, you know, get specifically into the, 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 the macro uh, rule, the regulations that have been proposed and talk about the comment period and the comments. Um, so in preparation for this, um, finding my way to uh, where do you submit comments to, which surprisingly, it wasn't the easiest thing to find. Um, it was it was not obviously yeah. linked. I actually had to find it through some other blog posts that linked it for me. Uh, but I found yeah. my way in there and everything's published. And there was at the time that I checked it, which was probably in the last like 36 hours, uh, 365 comments on the website from the public. Yeah. Uh, looked like a lot of providers or uh, physicians. Yeah, um, I think we're upwards of 400 now, I think is so, where we are with that. Okay. So how do you feel about that as a response at the point that we're at right now? And do you anticipate we're going to get much more in there? Oh, I think so. I think as we get closer to the deadline, I think you're going to see a big spike in the number of comments that go in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm getting ready to write mine, but I was sort of waiting for all this data to come in, including my interview with Mr. Slavitt um, that airs tomorrow. So, yeah, I think this weekend I may get started on mine. But I think as we get closer to the deadline, I think you'll see a big spike in the number of comments that go in. And I would hope that we, you know, get past a thousand and maybe get close to, you know, 2000 comments, hopefully far more than have ever been received, you know, in a comment period regarding regulations before. And hopefully, you know, it becomes a story in itself where everybody's kind of blown away by the level of scrutiny and the level of involvement. That would send a very strong message, I think. Yeah, I agree. And that might stand a chance to get its own headline and to pull some more people in there that aren't thinking about it. Because I mean, let's face it, the vast majority of the country, probably like a very high 99 percentile of the country is not thinking about this at all. Um, or even know no, that. And, and even, you know, historically comment periods have been for industry insiders and just, mm -hmm. you know, it's almost been a wink and a grin kind of thing. But now this thing is, is, is wide open. And I'll, I'll, I'll give a little teaser about the interview tomorrow. There was a couple of particular topics in macro that I challenged him with. And he said, yeah, you know what, we're hearing a lot of pushback. Uh, on a couple of key provisions of this rule. And, you know, if you read between the lines and take the risk of making an inference, that maybe, you know, there's going to be some big changes between the proposed and the final uh, with regard to at least a couple of parameters. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Due to this pushback. Yeah. Cool. So, so let's, talk, uh, let's talk about the things that you are thinking about commenting on right now and how those have evolved over the last week or two since, since your show. Sure. Um, you know, there's a couple of things that, that I, I probably the first suggestion is going to be that, you know, we, we push this back a year um, because it hasn't been studied enough. And then there's too many controversies and too much stuff to do. Uh, it'd be great if we could do two things. One is, you know, declare 2017 or 2016 a penalty for a year as far as behavior, because as we sit here and, you know, churn over macro, you know, we've still got meaningful use stage two to look at in 2016. Right. right. We got at the last minute legislative relief for 2015, but we still got 2016, which is a 365 day reporting period. And yet all of our bandwidth as a company you know, is, is sucked up by macro. So I'd like to see another, you know, penalty free year like 15 was for 16. And then, you know, 17, you know, we push off the, the go live for macro to 18 uh, and give us a, a chance to to really look at this rule and figure out the effects. But assuming that doesn't happen, um, then there's a few things we can look at. Number one is uh, if, if you look at the quality measures, or, you know, under meaningful use, we needed to report nine quality measures. Under macro, we're supposed to report six quality measures. Um, I think the number should be three instead of six. And I base that on two other authors, the first being uh, Don Berwick, Right. Who was, you know, used to be in that business and in those government posts. And um, and who was who was and he's the guy who was all gaga over the National Health Service in Britain. And he wrote an article in December of 2015 that said all this data reporting is useless. Uh, nobody's reading the data and, and it's it's distracting to the people trying to do the job. So he suggested a reduction in the numerators and denominators that we report by 50 percent. So, you know, half of nine would be four and a half. So his number would be four. Mm -hmm. um, the other author that I'm subscribing to here is John Halamka, who's the you know, chief information officer right. at Beth Israel Deaconess, used to have a government post. You know, he, he writes in the healthcare blog, you know, one of the leading folks that writes. And his yep. number was three. 
yep. for quality measures. And he, he said, look, we can't, you can't multitask beyond three. So I would say three quality measures. And I would say number two, that each of those quality measures has to undergo a higher level of scrutiny. There needs to be it's number one, scientific method behind the measure. Number two, a plan to actually read the data that's reported, which hasn't happened yet, right? We got six years of MU data, nobody's looked at. So one, it's got to be, um, uh, it's got to be scientific method. Number two, somebody's actually going to look at the data. And number three is any criteria needs to be able to be programmed to run in the background. So that as I'm churning through my busy day and I got exam rooms that are full and patients in the waiting room, I don't have any extra boxes to check. Mm -hmm. right? The software is sophisticated enough to run in the background. So a couple of questions on it. Um, yeah. We'll start. We'll start right there, just because the ended there is right. It running in the background. That's something that I hear a lot, and conceptually, I, I definitely buy into. But I'm not a doctor, and I don't know how this works. So walk me through like this checking of the box. You're seeing a patient. What are you doing? What are you checking? Like what? What is this box you're checking? And how could we capture that data without you doing so? Well, for instance, if. Um, uh, if uh, let's look at medication list, right? Because reviewing the medication list and reviewing the problem list are boxes that we need to check. Okay. Right? Those right that just now, says I, I did it, or are you putting in yes. detailed information of what you found during that? Yeah, yeah. I got it. Doesn't matter the detailed information. I have to check a box that says I did it. Okay, got it. I wrote the software to create that box. Okay. So you know, and it goes into a field that is reportable, and that's what generates the report. Got it. And what would be better is to just have a thing that could sense whether or not the medication list was opened. Okay. Under the doctor's user ID and password. Yeah. If it was opened, then, you know, give us a little benefit of the doubt. It was reviewed. If it was opened, it was reviewed. Same thing with the allergy list. If it was opened, yeah. it was reviewed. And, uh, you know, th that's the way you make this stuff run in the background. You know, I got our PQRS codes to run in the background. Yep. So we didn't have to manually report those. You know, if there was a, in, you know, if, if an otitis externa popped up, um, you didn't have to, you know, and again, this is an ENT specific code, right? We have a quality measure that says for, for a swimmer's ear, we're supposed to give drops rather than oral antibiotics. Well, you know, I wrote okay. the code that goes halfway that it, it has to ask you what you did, but you don't have to manually enter the PQRS code. You could take okay. it a step further and just have a look at your medication list. If you see drops on the list, Report it automatically. So yeah, I, I gotcha. write code myself, and I know it can be done. I know I can it, it can be done because yep. I've done it. Um, so it, it's got to be able to just all this stuff runs in the background, gathers the data, and you know there's all sorts of technologies you know for reading text and, and, and stuff that have not been deployed yet that could be mm -hmm. it could be done. Yep. Yeah, know, the reason absolutely. it hasn't been done is because the vendors have no incentive to do it. Yeah. Because so the, the summary is you're doing the thing and then you have to go check a box that says you did the thing in the same system. So very, yeah, I agree. Very easy to translate something like that over. So um, back to the first point, the three quality measures. Here's the thing that I've been struggling with understanding the proposed rules in general is it's easy to look at the proposed rule and make a form, form an opinion about what the rule is saying, but I don't know what the floor is. And we, we've, we've touched on that a few times. So, so for this particular one, do you know what, what in the legislation says they have to do quality measures and how specific is it? Um, have you gotten into that at all? Um, I will share what little I know. Okay. Um, I know that the legislation requires that there be a MIPS system, a merit incentive payment system, yep. and that that system assigns a score from one to a hundred and that that needs to be based on four categories. Okay. And one of those categories, and, and the categories are specified. So it has to be quality. It has to be EMR use. It has to be value-based purchasing and this clinical practice improvement thing. Yep. Um, so the four measures are specific. Now, beyond that, I'm not sure how specific it gets. I don't know if, you know, we can get by with three measures or it requires four or five or six. Um, but, yeah. um, you know, my intent would be that if we could get an extra year to work with it, we'll go back and, you know, I mean, we've been working with, uh, with congressmen as well as uh, CMS. And, you know, the, the bill that we got passed at the end of last year was a, an excellent example of how we had a congressman and CMS in the same room 
um, talking about, you know, relief for 2015. And the CMS folks say, well, look, the law says we have to enforce it in 2015. The congressman says, we'll fix that. What do you need? And, you know, there was an incredible sausage making conversation that went on. And yeah. as a result, you know, the last legislation passed in 2015 was the relief uh, from stage two for 2015. So if we need legislative changes, um, it's not impossible that we could get those. Got it. All right. Very good. So obviously the, the comments are huge and you touched on uh, let's get as many comments out there as possible and have that be its own story. But you also said that can't be the only response because there are a lot of folks involved. There's a lot of decision makers behind the scenes. Um, you know, and you speculated that who some of these people are that you might need to get to. Um, you know, obviously the president, secretary Burwell, uh, office of uh, budget and management. What is the yes. post June 27th, um, push for doctors like you? Uh, how, how do you, how do you keep that message going while the evaluation is going on and continue to influence it? Um, well, I think we use the assets we have to, to make our comments public. Um, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, upload your file to, you know, regulations.gov at two o'clock in the morning and, you know, wipe your hands of it and say, okay, job finished. Um, you know, we use, you know, our, our, to the extent that we have a bully pulpit or that we have a way to communicate and get the message out and say, here's what our comments were. Uh, and, and we're already starting to do that. Uh, and, and we're starting to, you know, and, and all of us who are commenting with the group that I work with, we all know what each other's comments are. Right. So, you know, we speak with, with, to some extent, one voice when we submit the comments, but then we also, uh, you know, take that public and take it to our colleagues and say, here's what we say needs to be done. And then when the final rule comes out to the extent that they, that they don't meet the, the requests uh, of, of that were shared by most people who commented, then we can say, Hey, look, you know what we had, we had a large number of people who said X needed to be done and it didn't get done. Right. Or conversely praise them for the ones that they did get done. And uh, yes, so, yeah, point. there's sort of a pre-final rule response and a post-final rule response. And, uh, you know, the final rule may come out somewhere very near election time. So, you know, there is um, there is a strategy, but, you know, we're going to have to call audibles as we go, depending on, you know, what we hear week to week. Yeah, got it. Awesome. Well, I, I certainly applaud you for spending all the time digging in the stuff that, that you've done. Um, you know, we always talk about it. It's real easy to complain about things and not like things and say how they ought to be, but a lot more difficult to go and read legislation and meet with government officials and spend your own time and your own money on, on trying to, to, to contribute and make it the way it's right uh, or make it right for everybody. So I applaud you for that. And I applaud you for not sitting on the sidelines. Um, that's awesome. Uh, I, I appreciate think. you having forums like this that we can, you know, help get the word out. So, yeah, absolutely. You're busy it's, too. it's my way. To, yeah, it's me trying to contribute in the same way. Exactly. So, um, and 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 I love learning from you from from everyone that I have on the show. So, uh, this has been good for me on that level. Um, but you know, that's that basically takes me through the the questions that I wanted to touch on here. I know you got patients waiting for you, so I'll, I'll let you uh, throw anything else out you okay. want to, or we can just wrap it right now. No, I, I think you covered it perfectly. I, think, okay. I don't think there's any anything that we've got left. Just a last reminder, everybody listen on uh, tomorrow morning, and um, you know we can we can talk about you know everyone's response to that in the future. Maybe get some folks on here to see what they thought about uh, what Andy had to say. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and it's 8 a.m. tomorrow, correct? On America Web Radio? Uh, 8 a.m. Eastern? Right. Yeah, okay. Awesome. Yeah, 8 a.m. Eastern, yes. I will, uh, if All I right. don't hit that, I will certainly be hitting the blab or the uh, the podcast when it comes out, and I'll share that with folks. Yeah, and, that'll be, uh, it'll probably be the following Monday is usually when it gets posted. Okay, great. And for everyone else that's still here, next week we've got uh, the Doc Smitty, uh, Dr. Justin Smith, coming on from Cook Children's in Fort Worth. Uh, he is actually doing uh, a lot of really cool, innovative things down there, one of which is he's building a clinic based on a lot of feedback coming directly from patients. Um, it's a cool story. He engaged them through uh, Facebook originally and did a lot of work on there. And he took, uh, he basically created a panel of, I believe it's five patients that uh, were really active with him on that Facebook page. And he built a patient advisory panel and they're advising his team in the hospital on building out this clinic um, for uh, newborns. Uh, so we're going to have oh, him on. He's really awesome. active in social media. Yeah, he's and his that's whole story, 
is is exactly the type of stuff that we're looking for in the way that they are. They're taking shots. They're not afraid to fail. He said, we've got projects that fail all the time. They try to do like a six month timeline on them, uh, have good measures, get in, get out. It's it's uh, all around. It's a really inspiring story. So I'm looking forward to that one. Um, I hope you all can come back and see it. And we've got beyond that, um, next one coming up will be on uh, um, patient generated data. Uh, we've got, we're targeting a couple of folks to come on and talk about that. And uh, then we'll be doing some startup showcases, actually. We're going to bring on some companies that are doing some new things uh, and have them basically give their pitch and give everyone an opportunity to uh, to give advice, to poke holes, um, obviously in a very you know a productive manner, but to, to poke holes, give them advice and, and uh, help them out. So it's kind of like a, a pitch-in uh, concept. So that's what we got coming. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in every week. And thank you, Dr. Mike, right. for joining us again today. Uh, Thanks for having me. Have a great day. Bye now. You too.